we are underdogs. We do hard things. You know, how can I tap into that? How can I help leverage my experience as an underdog so others can own their own true powers when they're faced with their own underdog moment? We all have so many mini moments of being an underdog, of saying, how can I ask the girl up? How can I do X, Y, and Z when no one thought I could do X, Y, and Z? And that's all what we do. That's what one does. Yeah. What do you do? I say people might have not have thought I could do what I'm doing today, but I'm not going to let that define my story. So Colby, I know a big part of your story and something that really came out in the book is the fact that as a teenager, uh, grade, grade seven, grade eight, you were diagnosed with this learning disability. What was that all about? So that moment really, it, it crystallized and was in this moment of time. But so many people in my previous schools, because I had to jump to another school, a special school um, in downtown Toronto for dealing with people with learning challenges who just see the world in a different way. So and, a special school for special kids who ride on the special bus, all of that stuff, yeah, right? Exactly. And, you know, you're in the process of like, you're like Clark Kent when he gets into the, the telephone box. You have your old self not knowing that what you have right now is your superpower. And you're here to save the world in your own way that only you know how to do so. So I, I remember it was 06 or, or 07. And I was taking out my normal school, normal friends. And it was hard for me. I remember saying to my dad who dropped me off that day, I said, do I really have to go here? Do I really have to go to the school for maybe three, two years? And he said, you, you do, but it's going to change everything. And that moment changed everything. And it changed not only how I saw myself, not only uh, academically, cognitive wise, but I made new friends. I saw things in a different way. And I'm just super grateful for that experience. And if I didn't have the adversity from the normal school, I don't think going into that, I would be able to have appreciated the gifts it would have taught me. And when you mentioned your dad, so your, your dad is, is Robin Sharma, you know, the speaker, the author, the super famous guy. But, uh, and, and maybe we can get into that relationship a little bit later. But what was the thing that was holding you back? What was, you know, when I was growing up as a kid, I was illiterate until grade five. Uh, I could not spell. I was in special help. I had a lisp. I had to go to speech therapy. And so I, I want to dig into this. Like, what was the thing that was holding you back? It would be mostly like cognitive basis on like academic performances. Pe teachers were starting to notice certain things of how would I act with like others and how I would do on certain tests. And they said, you know, I would highly recommend him. He's a great kid, has so much going for him. But I really would really recommend that you take him out for a little bit and explore another avenue of education and then bring him back into the normal system and then that moment is prepared me so well for law school especially for so much of what was to come in my academic career so help me help me right size this then so uh, you know we, we both have grown up in a, in a free country we've we've grown up in a free city we've grown up in you know upper middle class uh families that uh, give us you know the ability to be able to have tutoring or go to a special school or things like that. Yeah. I, I guess I struggle with, because for me, it's so shaped. Yes. I, I can remember the, the pressure, the constant pressure of trying to hide the fact I couldn't read. Mm -hmm. The constant pressure of, of just wishing grade three, my teacher, and then grade four, same teacher, Mrs. Kaja, please don't call on me to read aloud. Please don't ask me to spell. I felt every spelling test through grade five, through grade six, all of them. Now, one thing it did is because I used to have to write the word out 10 times every time I missed a word. I got really quick <laughs> at writing. <laughs> but I can just remember that pressure of trying to hide or cover this thing that everyone else seemed to be good at that I was not as good at. I don't quite understand how that didn't affect you. Was, was that the, the house you grew up in? Was that the environment? Was that the, the coaching or the mentorship of your dad? Like, how did, the, how did you not wear that at the time? Because it was more about like, you know, we're taking this at this level, but we're only doing it to help you elevate yourself. So there was no sense of like, you have to be shamed and destabilized and debilitated. And it's just, it's a natural progression through adversity. 
and you talk about the school setting people looked up to me in, in the schools i mean when i was you know grade one grade two grade three i would be able to recite a whole chapter of harry potter from memory from verse <laughs> so you talked about you know the academic sense and you know did you not feel other people were saying wow what a phenomenal a gift this guy has and i'm not saying that to brag in any way but i'm saying that we only see our gifts after the fact and when our gifts have been realized yeah we don't see it in that moment as as a gift we see it as i might have this but there's so much other that's going maybe negative with me but i want to say to people we have to always remember our gifts and it, it takes time to go through our moments of adversities together you know, I often say that, and I tell my kids, I have four kids, and I tell others, you know, our greatest strengths are also our greatest weaknesses. I am very good at at managing a lot of different things at, a, at, a, at different times because of, you know, ADHD or what have you. But it also means not so great at time management, prioritizing, I'm kind of scattered and all over the place. Uh, if If you're really great at getting out there and forming lots of relationships like the social butterfly, my daughter's kind of like that sometimes, but it, it it means sometimes you're so having so many relationships that they tend to be so shallow that people don't really know the real you. And so our greatest strengths tend to be our greatest weaknesses. But what I hear you saying is perhaps our greatest weaknesses conversely are, are maybe helping us form our greatest strengths. Do you, do you think that's totally. true? And it, it's a building block. You know, you take our, our weaknesses, but they're not crystallized in any one shape or form. They're just meant to help us see how we can hone them and develop them to get better. And as I share, you know, grit, great results in time. If we can take that into perspective, then that's something powerful that we can use. So do you feel like an underdog yourself? That moment and so many moments after that, of course. I I think, you know, there's one through line and is we are all underdogs in, in some shape or form. I remember when I worked at the Bank of Nova Scotia, I was an underdog because I, I hadn't worked in, in, in the financial services before in that setting. So I was an underdog with coping with those expectations, coping with that environment. An, I mean, an underdog compared to who? Compared to who? I mean, <laughs> people that were seasoned, people that were seasoned in the industry. And you're, you're, I, I remember saying to myself, I said, okay, I can only choose to respond to this give my best foot forward. I can only chose to do that. And I, I did. You have to help me understand or define this. I'm going to like, because even in that statement, you know, it's like going to law school in the UK, <laughs> um, coming into the Canadian law system or the Canadian financial system. I, I think most people would see the underdog as the underprivileged, the undereducated, the people with no resources. And maybe that's too comparative, what? but, 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 how, how uh, help me again with this? Sure. I so let me maybe just offer some um, my thoughts on that. I'd say that is the status quo underdog. That's the traditional form of underdog. But we all can, in so many walks of life, in so many situations, no matter if we're formal, corporate, informal, non-corporate, we all have that sense that says maybe I'm not right here. Maybe this organization might not be better with my input, with my role, but we all have that sense that says, or maybe not, let me just try, see what happens. And that moment is when we shed who we were before and then we cross into success. I remember in high school, someone said, I, um, you know, you didn't do too well on your grade 10 grammar exam. And I remember feeling very deflated, very, very deflated on that. And that was like um, a class I, I was really passionate about. We were learning some great things. And to have them say that re- remark to me didn't feel too good. And then I, I processed that. And I was like, no, I'm not going to let that define me. So shifting gears, you, you mentioned that you know you were, you were speaking to your dad about it. And he must have been a coach all along. Yeah. H- how was it growing up? in that household Uh, because, and I ask because over the last number of years, I have really grown in terms of mindset. I have worked to move myself 
from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, from a scarcity mindset to an abundance mindset. And this is a work in progress because I am just like my fit, my, my upbringing was always just work harder. Just you, you, you got lucky. You, 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 you earned this, you better, you better hold on to what you have. And, and so I was just so firmly rooted in that. But over the last number of years, I've been growing, I've been shifting, I've been changing, and I've been watching the impact on my kids. So as a father myself, I wonder if, uh, one, I believe that this is the very best thing I can give my kids. But I, I almost wonder, because you are a son who, who was perhaps raised in this type of household, what can you tell us about growing up, uh, you know, the son of, of Rob Sharma? You know, the experience was amazing amazing as a as a child you know growing up um you know his guidance and i remember like we would have so many conversations around the dinner table great chats and talking over like books ideas where he would take us and he was trying to take us on those trips on those journeys so we could have those experiences there would be some lessons within that you know he's guided me so well what i'm doing right now from law school to everything in between, he's been a true rock. <laughs> so he would actively share the breakthroughs or the lessons or the the mistakes or what have you throughout, like very open or like what advice would you give for us parents, you know, in terms of, in terms of here, here are the golden tips that you learned growing up. Just to live a life of impact. It would, it wouldn't be in that didactical formal sense, like, Oh, you know, just everything's like scripted, but it'd just be so organic. Like we'd be on a trip somewhere or be having like a Sunday dinner, those sets of, you know, nightly experiences, those nightly rituals. And we would just share so many things, you know, we would share when I was getting into like secondary school, you know, law school, great guidance on that. Um, everything in between, like guidance on, you know, what I'm doing right now with the writing and the book. And, you know, he's just been a tremendous, tremendous, father and a role model and someone just like, I just look up to tremendous. Huh. As you go, go off to law school and uh, you know, you're on, you're, you're an author now. And as you, it almost looks from the outside at the very least following your father's footsteps, how do you carve out your own lane? This is something that I think is very, very common. I know when I was growing up, my, I grew up in a construction family. Yeah. I really wanted to be an architect. I really wanted to be an engineer and my family loved that idea because it was a construction family. And then at a certain point, I got really scared. And I switched right at the very end of high school. I switched and said, I'm going to go to film school. That was not an acceptable topic. <laughs> it was like, that was not something that was worth going after. And it set me on this totally different life trajectory. But but often, you know, the pressure yeah. of that our parents put on us, either consciously or subconsciously. But then, But then there are times like, where you just want to do what you see your 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 grandparents or your uncles or your aunts or your parents. You just want to do what they do because you just think it looks badass and you want to be like them. How do you follow your dad's footsteps and yet still carve your own voice, your own path? How do you how do you maintain that? I, I think the first part is that's career 1.0. Career 2.0, career 3.0, that kind of guidance is more shaped with going inward into your own journey, whatever that looks like. Is it going from construction to film school? You know, what are you an underdog within that mindset? Of course you are. For me, you know, it's not so much in following in the footsteps, you know, consciously. It's more about saying, what can I share with others that I can only do in my own true way? The curveball that I was dealt with when I went from uh, quote unquote normal school to the special Superman school, quote unquote. You know, how can I tap into that? How can I help leverage my experience as an underdog so others can own their own true powers when they're faced with their own underdog moments? That is what I want to just do. That is how I feel I can help people in my own true way, distilling my own experiences, processing them, writing about them, and sharing them with as many people, young people, people coming up in today in the school systems, mid-career, early career, late career, and just with my authenticity. How old are you? Do you mind me asking? 28. 28. Gosh, it's, it, feels, it, feels, it feels so young to me. <laughs> How, so so as, as, as a 28-year-old dude, 
how do you go about calling yourself a philosopher? Let me ask you that. <laughs> I saw that in your bio and I was like, now that is ballsy. How do you go about calling yourself that? I, I think in many ways I have an old soul in me as well. <laughs> Just young on the outside, but in some part there's a an old soul, you know, in the Japanese three selves concept, it's like it's craft inside. So no, I mean, other than the fact I, uh, I studied philosophy in undergrad, you know, I want to help people by reframing their thoughts and experiences and ideas. If you look at grit, how can we take, you know, setbacks that we're having right now, reframe them so you can have the best pathway to shed fear, doubt, and to access your greatest powers, which I want to share in the underdog. How do we do that? You, you do that by reframing what is it that you truly want to accomplish by saying to yourself, I'm not going to let a setback define me. I'm not going to let myself just to be sucked into being reactive when there's a pathway to become proactive. I want to become more steadfast in what I want to do, how I want to be. Um, as I share, you know, in the curveball, we're, we work where we are because of our adversities, not in spite of that. And if we can reframe that in a very positive light, that's how we can get to success. Mm. If, if you go back a few years, uh, my good friend, Evan Carmichael and I had a podcast called Something to Prove. We did it for a few years. And if you can really actually chart my growth just by watching that weekly <laughs> podcast. But uh, I used to not make fun of him, but let's say tease him quite a bit because he was a master reframer. Yeah. And when you're cynical or when you're skeptical or when you're actually in a bit of a victim mindset, which looking back, I could see I was, mm -hmm. reframing seems like a lie. Yeah. It seems like you're tricking. You know, like I'm taking this terrible thing that happened to me. Uh, I've been diagnosed with an illness. Um, or let me let me use something even even more more real and personal, right? COVID hits, and the multi million dollar business I'm running suddenly sees seventy percent drop in revenue. <laughs> right? That's not good. Yeah. That's not fun. Yeah. I don't yeah. I don't want to have to deal with that stuff. So the way I could look at it is I could say, you know, this pandemic hits. It's uh, all my clients stop wanting to do work, and you know, woe is me, and and all of that stuff. But but I or I could reframe it. I could say. Well, now that I have 70% less work, what opportunity does this open for me with free time? How can I now focus my efforts? How can I... And so today, I'm a master reframer. I didn't even think you could learn it. I love reframing almost everything. And it drives people in my life crazy because they're still where I was a few years ago. And so I've learned the power of reframing. I've developed the skill set of reframing. And only as you're talking about it now, am I realizing that this was something that you could actually develop and learn. Did this always come naturally to you? Like, I'm almost curious if you've just yeah. always been a growth mindset, super optimistic dude. No, no of course not. <laughs> Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But it's by, it's by being like, you know, in the moment of adversity. In the moment of adversity is where you learn how to reframe, how to strategize more, how to look for advantages in in negativity, how you can overcome the curveballs and knock it out of the park in your own way. I mean, you talk about COVID and having to be more resilient and more adaptable. And it, it really taught us so many things about, you know, taking things for granted, taking how we used to be for granted. And we can't afford to do that as we go into the new world, certainly beyond, beyond the pandemic. You know, um, if you look at like the literature, so there's this great article by Dost Leslie Becker Phelps, PhD. And one thing she said is focus on the origins of how we want to respond. So if you want to respond in a way that doesn't allow you to look for the advantages in, in the negativity, where did that come from? There must always have been some kind of origin because you wouldn't just have developed that way of being automatically when you're faced with in the boardroom, 70% claps in revenue. Where did that come from? So we have to always sometimes take a step back and just think, what is the origin of this response? Is there an origin? How we can become more skillful at identifying it? And, you know, there's something I, I'd love to ask you. So 
uh, I, I read a lot about, you know, you mentioned your dad and, and the home you grew up in and it's chaotic and there was a sense of unease and, and bitterness and, you know, he, he struggled with his own stuff. And I want to know how did that play a part in you becoming not like that? How did that play a part in saying to yourself, I choose not to be identified with this kind of vice? And how did you break free of that rather than, or not just moving out at 16? Because there must have been some kind of deep underpinning that, you know, I see my dad in this state. Do I want to, you know, because do I want to help enable or do I want to not enable or do I want to, yeah. you know, be constructive in the engagements going forward? I'm just very curious as to how did that come to be? Well, so it was uh, growing up, that was my stepfather. Uh, my, my mom, my mom, no, no, it's quite right. My mom and, uh, and, and dad separated about a week before I was born. And so partially I was lucky because I never witnessed them. I, I don't remember them being married. And the second thing is they worked really hard to stay friends. I don't know how they did, but they stayed friends and they had a really great relationship and they're still friends today. You know, they call each other on their wedding anniversaries and things like that all of these years later. But when my mom remarried, and my stepfather, uh, you know, alcoholic, um, mental health issues, uh, angry person. T to answer your question, though, how did that affect me? Um, I, I don't know if I'm still over it. I I'm turning 40 yeah. next year, and I don't think I'm over it. I see myself with the, the incredible amount of anger and frustration that comes on in a snap, and, and for me, disappears in a snap as well. But I can see when my kids approach me and I turn to them without thinking, without taking a moment of pause, but I turn to them and, and, and I could see them tighten up because they realize they're interrupting me and they say, yeah. "Never mind," And they walk away. I could see at the dinner table uh, when I'm not there, if I'm going out and making a call or I'm just, I just have to step away. The, the volume and the fun would rise, but I would come back and it would quiet back down again. And so I, I start to see these little things when you're noticing that, oh, I am asking my children to be uh, dimmer versions of themselves around me. I'm asking my children to be not real versions of themselves mm -hmm. for, for my sake because of politeness or because of noise or because of other things. And yeah. so I Something don't... On but what's that? Like stepping on eggshells because you don't know how the person's going to respond. Yeah, and and that is how I grew up. That's yeah. that's that's the home I grew up in. And so, uh, as much as I've been really, really aggressively working through this, I would say for the last four years, uh, and as much as if four years ago you told me that it would take years and years and years to work through, I would have gone like, "Come on, it's it. These things don't take a decade to work through," and yet. I feel like I'm probably about halfway through it. And so, uh, you know, moving out the way that I thought of, uh, of home life, the way that I thought of relationships, the way that I, that I treat other people or how direct I am or my kids, the, the anxiety that I, that, I, that I sometimes have now, I had a lot of and I've been working through. Yeah. Um, the, the guilt I feel for self-care like honestly just it just yeah. seems like a, a waste of time and and I don't have like you know there's always go 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 all of those things make me up and this goes back to our our weaknesses can be our superpowers i have started to pat myself on the back for for the things that i'm awesome at because mm -hmm. i've spent most of the last 20 or 30 years honestly actually just noticing the things that i'm not good at yeah. and never 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 accepting the things that I'm actually pretty amazing at. And so, yeah, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I mean, maybe at some level, did that help elevate your sense of empathy for people who, in so, because that's so prevalent in the world today, you know, that masking self, did that help elevate your sense of empathy for people who are struggling and who might struggle with that in the future? I struggle with empathy because I am actually very, very empathetic as soon as we can touch on someone's story. Yeah. And I've told my wife this uh, in passing and in the past, if there's someone that, that I'm kind of judging or I find myself writing off, yeah. uh, often what I will say to myself or even to my wife is like, 
can you please help me get to know them better? Because as soon as I get to know their story, as soon as I get past the surface level and and even (laughs) I'm even in this interview, like just like just not necessarily hammering you, but I just I really want to know the stuff behind the stuff. And as soon as you can get into that, I just have such empathy and sympathy and and, and a sense of camaraderie and connectedness to, to people. I just, the more, and, and this is this is what many business people struggle with when people talk about authenticity, when they talk about vulnerability. Yeah. Um, the truth is, the more revealing you can be, yeah, you might upset some people. Yeah. Yes, some people might decide they don't like you. Okay, great. But the judgment yeah. comes down because as soon as, as soon as I picture you not as, you know, Colby, not as the author or the the guy who went to law school or the philosopher or any of that stuff. As soon as I picture you as the 12 year old boy who is, is, you know, grabs his lunchbox and puts on his coat and, and it's, it's a, it's a cool September day and you're going to school for the first time in this new school and you're walking through the doors and the teacher's greeting you and you don't know anything. As soon as I imagine that little version of you, doesn't your heart just melt for that person? And and I have actually worked over the last number of months at even just imagining five year old me, yeah. eight, eight year old me, ten year old me, and 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 saying the words that um, he needed to hear that no one else took the time to tell him at the time. And all of that stuff in my head, I haven't, I haven't, I don't know if I've processed it well or not, but I, I don't know if I have the answers yet or not. But it's helped. Have you done that type of work yourself? I have. I have it in many ways, but I think I can do so much more on it. And I think that's something we don't do too often. Like when I was like at five, until someone says that would be a great thing to do. So go, going back to what I was like in that moment, I was beside myself. I felt so alone because I was going into an unknown environment, an unknown school. I didn't know who I would meet. I didn't know what I'd be like. I just knew this would be something that people said would be good for me. But I had to start to do the work. I had to start to to show up every single day and not say, this is an exercise that makes no sense. Because they're like, no, this is an exercise that does make a lot of sense. I mean, one of the exercises was just reading a clock. Just reading a clock, the hands on the clock. That would help along the lines with comprehension. But it was those just those little gifts. Just, oh, <laughs> I used to, I used to copy. <laughs> I used to copy off Jonathan Pang, the guy, my friend who sat beside me. <laughs> it just like we just did that over and over, and it's it was otherworldly, you know, because you always knew you are intelligent in some way, but you had a baseline, and then the normal system baseline level of intelligence. You do your your tests, you do your EQAOs in grade ten, grade nine. But then these moments help you elevate it to another level. When I came out, I was nothing like I was when I came in. And when I was crying, I said to my dad, like, no, I don't want to go here. And it was just like, he's like, okay, you are going to be okay. You are, you are intelligent. You are so intelligent. And I think that's something when we get to adversity, when we get to that sense of struggle, we don't want to think that we're okay, but we are okay. We are okay because we have that inbuilt perseverance, resiliency system within us to help elevate us through the bad times. Oh, That's how we can to see opportunities. That's how I met my best friend was in that unknown environment. I didn't know him from Adam. I didn't know who he was. But we just, we've been to get friends, we're best friends for 15 years. Yeah. And it was just surrendering to that moment that I was able to be okay. These are going to be two really good years. We're going to eat well. We're going to do a lot of sports, a lot of games. You know, how much of this? How much of this that you're sharing is actually what happened, and how much of it is you reframing <laughs> and you reframing your memory of what it actually meant to you? Do you know what I mean? I, I'm someone that sees the past in my mind's eye. Everything is as it was back then. I still remember those Castle Loma doors. I still remember this school's location, St. Clair and Davenport. I still remember the park we went to. 
every single thing is as I see. I go back often and I have this thing where I like to look at my past because it's a reminder of where I'm at right now and how much farther I have to keep on going. And I just see in my mind's eye, like, you know, when I wrote The Underdog, when I wrote The Curveball, I did it because I saw people in my mind's eye that I wanted to really share my message with. Like, I saw the people with learning challenges. I love to do so much more work with them. You know, schools, anything I could do to help. Because that was me once back then. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. You've touched on two things. One... Uh, when you were talking about the story about going in to school for the first time and feeling alone and, and, and all of that, something that Dr. Benjamin Hardy writes in Personalities and Permanent, at least it's the first time I came across it, is this idea of the empathetic witness. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I heard this and I was talking to my wife about it, we realized that that for our kids and so so what we can be for our kids, but also what we need for ourselves, isn't someone to come in and solve our problems for us. It isn't someone to come in and and be the superhero or, you know, make things right or be helicopter parents or in business, not someone who's going to come in and save us. But what we actually need is an empathetic witness who can simply hear what we're saying, make us feel seen, make us feel heard, and help us frame what this actually means. And it sounds like with your dad or with the other people in your, in your kind of social circle at the time growing up, that you had that support. You had someone to help you understand what this means and, and the impact. And I tell my son all the time, if anyone listening who has ADHD, if anyone listening has depression or anxiety or dealing with any type of, of stigma or, 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 or setback of that kind, um, it's not that it's not serving you. It's just maybe not serving you right now at this age or in this environment. Because I tell my 13-year-old kid all the time who has ADHD, listen, man, you're a challenging kid. But I said, when you're 25, when you're 40, when you're 60, you are going to take over the world. Like the very things that make you a bit of a handful, you know, at eight, Yeah. why are those things going to serve you when you're older? And I've been able to learn that. And so hopefully for him, I'm that empathetic witness. Do you seek that out today? Or is that something that you that you actively do? I do that and I seek it out. I want to be there for people to say, I know you're struggling. You know, people have come to me, not just because of this kind of work, but just you're a great guy. I want to be around you. You know, I'm going through this path right now. How can you help me? You know, how can I be there for others? Because we are our brother's keepers. We are our sister's keepers. You know, we are where we are today because of so many people that have shaped our beliefs, honed us through adversity, guided us. You know, I've been grateful to have a, a very supportive family. You know, my dad, my grandparents, my mother, so many people that said, you know, we're not going to let Colby just be defined by this learning challenge because we know that this is temporary. His potential is infinite. And I think when we're get faced with the adversity, you know, we're faced with the ADHD, we're faced with the isms. I, I have this saying, learning disability, do not diss my innate ability because you have your innate ability. <laughs> you have your vulnerability. And at first it's like, yeah, it sucks. You're vulnerable. You're shy. How do you approach girls when you're like that? How do you do well on tasks when you're like that? You're not going to be picked for sports teams. But then, to your point, that is how you create value for others by tapping into your vulnerability in the corporate field, intrapersonally, with your relationships. That is how you really drive value. And you don't drive value and you don't express vulnerability just by intellectualizing it. You feeling it, feeling yourself what it was like in that moment. I see, think, and feel that moment of adversity, that moment of where I was 17 years ago, 16 years ago. And that's what enabled me to say, I don't care how long it takes to produce this. These people who I was with might get something from it. I know that you're, you mentioned the book Underdog. Um, it's, it, I'm going to circle back around on that word because I find it such an interesting word. Yeah. And so... What what power do you think that that has 
for those who are either unwilling to call themselves an underdog or when you're willing to take on the mantle and say, you know what, I am an underdog. Does that flip something in our minds? Because we'll root for the underdog in the movie. We'll root for the underdog at the Super Bowl. Uh, will we root for ourselves? Such a great point. We are when we the moment we put on Superman's proverbial U-shaped cape of the underdog, we feel something. We feel something that says this enables me to act in a right way. This enables me to act in the way that will help others. And we can root for ourselves. We should root for ourselves. You know, not just saying others have done it. Oh, others overcame like the Seattle Seahawks did and they beat the Patriots. You know, we all have that underdog within us. And certain instances, certain situations drive us to bring out the more powerful underdog that we have within us. Hmm. And I, I think the reason why we, we, don't, we don't allow it to shine is because there's a gap with us. There's a gap within ourselves and externally. And when we overcome those gaps, when we reframe things, when we process our thoughts, when we process our emotions, when we call on others for help, that is how we overcome the underdog obstacle. And so how do you battle the who am I to question that we all face? Who am I to go off and write a bunch of books? <laughs> who am I to go off to law school? Who am I to get on stage? Who am I to to preach these things? Who am I to come up with this new framework that I think could help a lot of people? Mm-hmm. Who, who am I? You know, it's it's the question, it's it's the question that we ask ourselves too often that we should probably not be asking ourselves at all. I think when we ask the question too much, we get into overthinking and not appreciating how what we have gone through is our potential, is our story. We've all had a journey. We all live the same day, 365 days of the year. We all have so many, many moments of being an underdog, of saying, how can I ask the girl up? How can I do X, Y, and Z when no one thought I could do X, Y, and Z? And, and that's all what we do. What do <laughs> one, that's what one does. Yeah. What do you do? I say to myself, I say, people might have not have thought I could do what I'm doing today. But I'm not going to let that define my story. I'm going to be true as I can to what I've gone through, to how many moments of adversity that I've dealt with, whether it's in school, whether it's in life, whether it's in occupationally, interpersonally. But I'm not going to let that define my potential. And I'm going to use that to help others just as I am an underdog right now. I didn't think I could be on, you know, the podcast that I'm on right now. And I might just be like, I'm this dude. I don't know how will my story be received, but it wouldn't stop me from trying and just giving it my very best. I like to think that I'm not that intimidating. (laughs) (laughs) Although now that I think about it, everyone I meet socially tells me I'm really intimidating. (laughs) And so when you're really facing that doubt and that fear, when you really feel like you're in over your head, what are the specific words or what question do you ask yourself to help push you through? What would myself 10 years ago have thought of the current difficulty? If it is a difficulty, what would the, what would, I've thought 10 years ago. If I don't do this, can I help to have the impact I want to have? If I don't do this and live authentically and true to my own experiences, will I ever reach the expectations that I have set for myself? I just think like, you know, it's not so much about just setting, you know, expectations and maybe hitting them, maybe not hitting them. How can you calibrate the expectation so you do hit them, but you just reframe it and you just do it authentically? You just do it authentically and everything you do is just done to just maybe help others in a certain way. Through the underdog, through 
you know, because people right now, people write them off in so many ways, but that can be used to help you help others. Last question for you, uh, and, and I've got to ask this. For you at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? It comes down to bettering myself, bettering myself and helping to achieve a life of impact. You know, I have been doing this for many years, but what I've been able to do and how I want to continue to grow myself, that's what it's all about. And helping others along the way truly just means a lot to me. And being around and having so many experiences just adds to it. And for everyone listening who says, that feels selfish if I were to do what you just said, bettering myself, you know, all, all of this stuff. How is that? How is you taking the time and the energy and the focus to do this not selfish? Because if we don't do it, nothing we do for others would be of any use. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't feel really real anyway. It wouldn't be as good as it could have been if you did it for yourself first. So do not think it as like selfish, selfless. That's the way to approach it. Selfless. And remember, you know, it's okay to have like the adverse moments to know when you're feeling challenged, but just because you're feeling challenged, that is where you should spend most of your time. That is where you should be spending most of the time, you know, doing it, feeling it, processing it, trying it, and being around it. Because it's going to suck, but what's not going to suck that's not going to have um, value for it. Yeah, man, this is We Do Hard Things. Listen, if if it's uncomfortable... Good. If if it if it's painful, if it if it hurts, if it scares you, those are all the indicators you're you're going the right way. Keep going, right? We are underdogs. We do hard things. We we do hard things. We, we people see too often people think like I have this experience that I just went through. Someone else might not understand it, might not be able to relate really to it. Fine, but others might be able to. That's how you can help people. That's how you can keep pushing yourselves and keep bringing people with you. And I share that in The Underdog. I say how we can use that in a way that helps be more authentic, your vulnerability, bringing that out and carrying that with you as you go forward.